If you have your Bibles, guys, let's go ahead and grab those two and turn with me to Esther chapter 5 this morning. We are in Esther chapter 5, getting back into the book of Esther as we're continuing through it. We'll be seeking today to study through both chapters 5 and 6. And if you're taking notes today, the title for today's message is The Plan in Motion. The plan in motion, and we will see that plan in motion as we move through the text, the plan that Esther is walking in to see the Jews saved. And as we get into the text, it makes us, uh, it makes us more aware of what we're studying as we see the breakdown of the book of Esther, as well as the themes within it, consistently reminding ourselves of that. And we know that Esther breaks up into three sections. We see in chapters one through three, the setup, where we see the characters within the story are introduced to us, and they're put into the positions that they are to be in for the story to take place. And then chapters four through seven, what we're seeing now is the stand, where during the setup, as we saw the villain, Haman, who was introduced to us, who was an Amalekite, a descendant from King Agag, we saw that he had a plan that he gave to King Ahasuerus to have the Jews eradicated in all the provinces of Persia. And now what we see is here in this section, this stand by both Mordecai and Esther as well to see the Jews saved. And that's what we're seeing within the text today, that plan unfold. But also too, what we're going to see in the next section is the salvation that comes out of that plan. As the Lord saves his people in chapters 8 through 10, we see God's people saved from the evil plot of Haman to eradicate the Jews from the Persian Empire. And the themes that we see within the book of Esther, we've discussed, but they always do well to remind ourselves so as to know what we're studying and what we are to apply from this book. We see first and foremost that of God's sovereignty and his providential care. Though the name of God is not mentioned once within the book of Esther, we see him working undeniably throughout all of the text. And it is easy to see, and it's also something for us to know is true in our own lives, that God is always working and moving behind the scenes, even when we don't feel him, even when we don't think that he's there, he is absolutely working. Also, we see God's calling of people to his purpose, how God calls people to himself, to mission, and to specific things that he has for us as we walk with him in this world. And another thing that we see is the fact that God loves his people. And contextually for the book of Esther, that's with the Jewish people, as his chosen people are there, and he is protecting and saving them from the danger that is, that is coming at them. But what we can also glean from that is that God God loves us as his people, as his church. God loves his people, and we see that through the Bible. And as we open up in our text today, we come today to a pivotal moment in the story of Esther. And we've seen much action within the book itself. It's a great story to read, just on its own, to read as a great story. And it's an exciting one, and we've seen some excitement up to this point. I mean, you think about just the setup of the book of Esther, where we have Mordecai and Esther and Haman. They're introduced to us, each of them playing their own part. Where you have Esther, who is this young Jewish orphan who's being raised by her adopted father, Mordecai. And she she ascends to the throne as the favored queen there in the Persian Empire. Along, along with their movement into their positions and, and places, we're also introduced again to the villain of our story, a man by the name of Haman. Haman is an Amalekite. He is the descendant of King Agag, who we meet in 1 Samuel. And what we know from Haman is that he is he is, he is indignant towards Mordecai because Mordecai, a Jew, a man of God, is not going to bow to this enemy of the Lord. And so Haman, indignant and angry at, at Mordecai, hashes out this plan to not just see Mordecai done away with, but to see all of the Jews done away with in the Persian Empire. And so he goes to King Ahasuerus, a very fickle leader we've learned so far. He's very easily swayed by, by the influence of those around him. And he goes to him and says, hey, we should eradicate all the Jews within the provinces, all 127 provinces of Persia. We should do away with them, king. And the king's like, all right, man, let's make it a law. And they do it. And at the learning of this, Mordecai, who is one of our main good guys, he starts to mourn. He starts to mourn, and he's, he's wrecked by this news, as is so many others within the nation of Israel, within the nation of Persia, and from the tribes of Israel, excuse me. But we also see not just Mordecai mourning, but an exhortation that he takes to Esther. Esther, who is there in a position that he says she is put in for such a time as this, he goes to her and says, hey, you need to go to the king 
and you need to see if you can change the decree. You need to go to the king and see if you can rewrite and remove this decree so that the Jews will be saved. And it takes, as we saw last time we were in the book of Esther, some convincing, some moving, some exhortation from Mordecai to Esther to get her to the point of saying, yes, that is what I need to do. We see some resilience from her as she's fearful of the, the impending death that could come from, from going to the king. She is fearful of what might happen if she's to go to the king uninvited. But yet Mordecai again exhorts her saying, hey, for such a time as this, you have been put in this position and so you should go to the king. And where we ended last week was Esther's realization of her task before her. This realization of the reality that she was put in a position to go and see if she could rewrite the decree of the king, reverse it to see if the Jewish people could be saved. And that brings us to today, to Esther, now three days removed from her decision to go there to the king, where she has spent the time fasting and seeking out bravery and boldness, no doubt from the Lord, she is now ready to go and present herself before the king. And so that's where we pick up in our text today, a pivotal moment here where what we see as we open up in chapter five is Esther's faith that is displayed for us. And we're going to see that as we read, and then we're going to seek to learn from it as we unpack it. So pick it with me there in verse one of Esther chapter five, where it says, now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. And so it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand and Esther then went near and touched the top of the scepter. The king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. And so Esther answered, if it pleases the king, then let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman, they went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. What is your request up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. And then Esther answered and said, My petitioner request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Let's pray real fast before we move forward. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much that, God, as we read and endeavor to study your word, that, God, you invite us into this. You are about this. You call us to this, Lord. And I thank you so much for the kindness that you show us in giving us the Bible and making it plain for us to read and to see. And also, Lord, giving us the Holy Spirit to teach us the word, to teach us, Lord, the deep things of God as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I pray that right now, that knowing that you invite us to this, knowing that you call us to this, that you want us to have this, that, Lord, you would be our teacher and we would submit to your word and to how you want us to apply your word. And I pray this, Lord, expectantly, because I know that as I ask to learn, God, you are there to teach. So, Lord, be with us now as we seek to study your word. Help us, Lord, because we need that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, Esther's faith is what we just saw displayed, really faith in action as the text opens up for us. We have this scene painted very plainly for us. Esther, again, having fasted for three days, she here puts on her royal robes and she goes to the inner court of the king's palace to where he can see her from across the way. And you'll remember that up to this point and from chapter four, that Esther has not seen the king in some 33 days. She had told Mordecai, in fact, one of her resistant statements to Mordecai saying, you need to go to the king, was that, hey, I haven't been invited to go into the presence of the king for 30 days. And now having fasted for three days, it's now 33 days. And the principle behind this, the reason she's concerned is because, again, within the Persian empire, the ruler, the king was seen as deity. He was seen as a god among men. And to go into the presence of the king, to go into the presence of this God among men was to go to was to go and take your life in your own hands if you were uninvited because if you invaded the space of the king and he didn't want you there well it was death it was death for you there on the spot and Esther knows this Esther knows this it was an argument that she gave to Mordecai at the first of him exhorting her to go to the king and it was also a, wrapped up within a statement that she made once she said I will go to the king 
Where last week in verse 16 of chapter 4, she said, I will go to the king to see if I can see the Jews saved. And she says, if I perish, then I perish. And she's displaying in this, this willingness, this surrender to the will, honestly, of this king as she goes and sees if she can do a work to save her people. And when, again, this is a pivotal moment within the text it's a pivotal moment as she's now putting feet to the faith that she has, as she's putting feet and faith to the prep work of fasting and seeking out boldness to go before the king. And right off the bat today, right off the front, we have an application for us from this text. Something for us as the church to realize is, is there explicitly for us to see because what we see with Esther, having been alerted to call and, and called to step out, and also having fasted and prepared to go and to do this work, what we see in Esther today is the stepping out, is the going, is the faith that she displays in the work that she is called to do. And this is important for us as the church because again, we are, as God's people, called, this is a theme consistently through the book of Esther, it's been in the book of Ezra, just a spoiler alert, it's going to be in the book of Nehemiah that we're going to next, that God calls people to himself, to go and to do his will for him in this world, on mission, living out for him. And those things that he calls us to do, we've gone over it before, are sometimes scary. They're contrary to the movement and the tender and the work of the world, because the world is against the Lord inherently. It's oftentimes against and, and opposite to our own plans that we have. But the Lord is kind in that he helps us and prepares us, much in the way that he did Zerubbabel there in the book of Ezra to go and to build the temple, much as he did with Ezra as he there gave him the word and Ezra put in the time to learn the word, much as with Esther here, who has taken the time knowing the job before her to fast and to prepare and to gain the boldness to go forward. In the same way God calls us, he calls you and myself, all of us are involved in the mission of God. And what that means is that we too need to know what God is calling us to. We need to prep and pray and prepare. And we do that in different ways by praying first and foremost and seeing what God has for us. By getting in the word and having things confirmed to us. By fasting if the Lord leads us to do that, to hear his voice. But then actually stepping out actually stepping out into the thing that God has called us to do. And you see, what we see within the book of Esther today is that very thing displayed for us and an example of that being carried out and a call inherently from the word for us all today. To know again, as we see here in the text, the events that are going to take place, understand from this moment on, are directly and decisively in happening because of Esther's involvement, because of Esther's faith to step forward and to move, we see her included in the work of the Lord. We see the events of the rest of these chapters, a result of Esther being faithful to step into the work that God has for her. And the same is true for us. The same is true for us, friends, that as God calls us to whatever it may be that he has called you to, whatever he's called me to, whatever he's calling us as a church to, he is there to prepare us. He is there to lead us and to make us ready to go forward. But then he calls us to step forward. In faith, he calls us to step forward, to step and to see what he's going to do and how he's going to meet us as we step out into the work that he does. And we need to understand today the example that Esther gives us. The text shows us here faith that is put into action, faith that moves forward, faith that says, I'm not just going to prep and prepare and then at the last moment bail, but I'm actually going to step forward and see the Lord work and know that the Lord's going to meet me as I do so. And that's such an example that we have just right off the front today, seeing here Esther's faithfulness. And a challenge for all of us, because again, God is calling each of us to himself. God is calling each of us into something, some place and space, some work within your life and what God has you doing in your life. God says, hey, I want to use you and I want to prepare to use you. I want to equip you to be used, but then I want you to step out. And the Lord is calling each of us to do that at various places and spaces of our life. And so the call and the question, the challenge is to think, all right, Lord, what are you calling me to? Am I in a time of preparation or am I in a time of needing to step out and to walk forward? And every one of us understand today are in one of those two places because God is always calling us. He's always seeking to use us and to guide us and to lead us. And we are called to step out in faith just in the same way that Esther does here as she's prepared to do so. 
And as she does, we see in the text as she, as she steps out, we see that Esther, she again finds favor as she has so many times within the book of Esther. She finds favor there with the king. And he there extends the golden scepter to her and invites her to come into his presence. And he asks her there, hey, what, what's your request, Queen Esther? What would you like? And he says they're up to half the kingdom. He's like, hey, whatever you would like, whatever you would need, hey, I have got you. And if you're reading this story for the first time, you're like, all right, this is the moment, right? Like, again, this is an exciting story. And you're reading it, you're like, this is where Esther's got this audience with the king. He didn't just have her executed on the spot. This is the moment where she's going to ask for the salvation of her people. And then she doesn't. And you're like, what? what? <laughs> she's like, come to dinner. You and Haman, come to a banquet that I'm going to prepare for you guys. Come to the banquet tonight. And then as you're reading, if it's the first time you've ever read it, you're like, all right, that's the moment. He's gonna, she's going to whine and dine and get them all ready and soften up. And then she doesn't do it. And you're like, what? <laughs> come on, man. And we don't know why she doesn't do it. The, the Bible isn't explicit as to why she does it. And I, I want to point that out to you because there are commentators and teachers of the book of Esther who seek to paint Esther in, in, in a sense of faithlessness here in this time where she has this lapse in faith where she becomes fearful and decides that she's not ready to ask the question. And to think that, understand, I, is, is a bit, is a bit uh, presumptuous of what the text is not saying. The text is not saying that she is fearful. Nowhere in the text do we see that she is fearful except when it explicitly says back in chapter four that she's fearful. And so to, again, read in between the lines and to think to yourself, oh, well, Esther stepped out in faith. She did a good job. Then she just bailed on it. I think that's wrong because the Bible doesn't explicitly say so. And so we need to be those Bible students that look at what the Bible says and say, hey, you know what? The Bible says this, so I'm going to go with this. And what I would say is that as we see Esther here, we see great faith continues to be display, displayed by her. As she continues to step out, as she steps out and gains an audience with the king, and what we are seeing from here now, as she steps out, the plan of the Lord is in motion. The plan of the Lord to have his people saved, it is in motion. It is only going to continue to move forward as we walk through the text. But the author, what he does next, as we pick up there in verse 9, is he switches now from, from Esther and from the king and the audience that she has there with Haman and him, and it now moves and hones in on Haman. And we really get to see in this time as Haman is leaving the dinner party, we get to see kind of insight more so into Haman's heart, into who he is, into how he is acting, and really, honestly, where his heart is lying. And we see great fickleness within Haman as a man of the world, and his attitude and actions are going to continue to move the story forward as well as we pick up in verse 9. So let's do that. Read with me there. Where it says, So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart's. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. And nevertheless, Haman restrained himself, and he went home, and he sent and called for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. And then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he advanced him above all the officials and servants of the king. And moreover, Haman said, besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I'm again invited by her along with the king. Yet all of this, he says, avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gates. And then his wife Zeresh and all of his friends, they said to him, let a gallows be made, 50 cubits high. And in the morning, suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. And then go merrily with the king to the banquet. Yeah, that's what you do. And the king, this thing pleased Haman. And so we had the gallows made. Again, what we see here is real insight into the heart of Haman. And it is a fickle heart, if you notice. Like in verse 9, we have this replay, really, of, of what caused the whole issue between Haman and Mordecai in the first place. As again, Mordecai is a Jewish man. Haman is an Amalekite, is a descendant of King Agag, and the Amalekites were the enemies of the Jewish people. And so as Haman is promoted into this position of power, and he walks by Mordecai, Mordecai's like, I I'm not bowing to you because I know that you are not just a, a Persian official that I'm in bondage to, but, but you're an enemy of the Lord. So he doesn't bow to him, and that causes the whole issue that we're in right now. But we see that as Haman is, is exiting dinner, bringing it back to this chapter, that he's on cloud nine, man. He's excited. He's like, yeah, I just had dinner with the king and the queen. This is the best. And he's just walking out, head hell high, chest puffed out. And then he sees Mordecai, and he's like, oh, that guy. 
I mean, just talk about mood swings, man. He's just like the same verse. In verse 9, words worth of space apart, we see Haman just like, yes, I'm the best. This is the worst, you know, just so angry. And then he gets home, and verse 10 tells us, and he brightens up a bit because he invites his wife and his friends around him. And what we see there is Haman displaying his, his prominence, his position, his, his possessions. He talks about his place at work, his status. He talks about his, his kids. He brags on his kids. He talks about all that he has. And the icing on the cake is the fact, again, that he went to dinner with the king and the queen. And at the same time, he's also invited to dinner the next day. But then in verse 13, another mood swing comes. Because as he's talking about all of these things and he's excited and he's just trusting in and honing in all of, on all of them, he then swings to the other side of the pendulum and he says, but none of these things matter. None of these avail me as long as Mordecai is sitting in the gates. He's like, none of these things matter to me. They're all good. They're all big. I'm amazing. But as long as that guy, it doesn't do anything for me. And his wife, Zeresh, we will see her again in a minute as well. She and and his friends, they give him some advice on what to do about Mordecai. They tell him to go and to have a gallows built, to go and have a tall gallows built so that everyone could see if he was able to hang Mordecai on them. And they say, hey, go build this gallows, go build this execution device. And then, hey, go ask the king if you can take care of Mordecai. Just remove the toxic person from your life and you will be fine. And that counsel he takes to heart and he goes and he starts to build his little project there. And we're going to see in a moment that he's going to head to ask the king if he can execute Mordecai. But as we see here Haman and his fickleness, and you read this, you kind of feel sorry for Haman in a way. You don't like him in a lot of ways, but you feel kind of sorry for him in this way. How he's just so tied up in his position and his trust is in his status and in his resources. And as you look and see that it takes just one guy, one thought of a guy, just looking at one guy to derail him from everything that he holds dear to him. And again, the counsel that he has as he's surrounded by these people is to just, hey, do away with the guy and you'll be fine. And you read about Haman here, and it's not honestly hard to see the world represented in Haman. The world represented in Haman that holds in and holds on and desires to be seen as put together because of what they have within the world. And it's not hard to see the world within Haman, but if we're honest with ourselves, it's also not hard to see ourselves in Haman either. Because as humans, we have this innate ability, this proclivity to to base our success, to base our, 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 our mood and everything off of what we own off of the status that we have, the position that we can attain, the money that we have in the bank, all of the stuff, the tangible things that we have, we say, hey, look at this, I'm awesome. The problem with that is, it's tangible temporal things of this world that if we have too hard of a grip on and put our trust in, can be derailed by any one little thing that comes our way. Which is why it's so important for us to see this example in Haman. And to ask the Lord, hey, am I in that same camp as well? Do I have, we need to ask, a loose grip on the world and the things of it? And do I find my worth and my identity in Jesus? Because that's exactly what we as the church are called to do. We as a church in this world, living in this world, as citizens of this world, which we all are and need to live as citizens of this world, need to never let that outweigh our citizenship and our identity that we have in heaven and in Jesus Christ. Because if we do that, no matter of possession or position or anything that you may have in and of yourself, none of that will hold because you're putting your faith in something shallow. You're putting your faith in something that is temporal again. When we are called, when we are invited by the Lord to wrap our identity up in Jesus Christ, and we as a church need to be about doing that. And it's so good that we can. And it's such a a freeing thing to know that we can when you really think about what this world requires of us and what Jesus requires of us. Because this world, it says, hey, the more you attain, the more you have, the better you look, hey, the more awesome you you will appear. The problem with that is this world is fickle. Our hearts are fickle. And so as we walk and try to attain and do all these things, it doesn't take much to derail us. And we just keep having to try to attain and move and work and grab so as to be appearing more awesome and having it together. And that's what the world requires. You know what Jesus requires? Nothing. You know why? Because we have nothing to offer him. 
We have a God in heaven who loves us while we were separated in our sin and enemies with him because of our sin that says, hey, you know what? I want you to identify with me in the finished work of my son, Jesus Christ, who died for you. And I'm so thankful for that reality because this world trying to attain and work and move and live in that, again, it's fickle and it's hard, it's exhausting, and it amounts to nothing in the scheme of eternity. Whereas with Jesus, I mean, I come to him and say, Lord, I, I have nothing to bring but my sin that you took care of that I want you to take from me and I want to identify with you. And he says, come on. And Haman here, again, is an example of this world, but also, if we're honest, an example of us in so many ways and a challenge for us to say, Lord, where am I wrapped up? Where am I identifying myself today? Am I identifying myself with this world and the world that is, again, fickle and flighting away? Or am I wrapping up my identity with you? Am I derailed easily by the things of this world, by those things in this world that are temporal because I'm relying on the temporal to elevate me? Or am I steadfast in the Lord because I'm walking steadfastly with you? You know, as you look at Haman, you look at Mordecai, they're great opposites. They're great parallels of one another. As you look at Haman, again, he's derailed by just looking at Mordecai. He's of the world, his heart is in the world, and he's desiring just to attain and appear just awesome continually because of his things within the world, and he's derailed by one view of a person. Mordecai, on the other hand, a Jewish man, a man who is, who is of good character, who is faithful and trusting in the Lord to do what God is going to do for his people, he sees Haman, he's like, ah, no big deal, man. I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about these things of the world because I know where I'm standing and who I'm standing with. My friends, the same thing is available to us. And we are called to that as the church. And we are called to be those that find our identity in the Lord and not allow ourselves to be fickle as Haman can be here, as, fa- as Haman is displayed here because we're putting our hope in having a tight grip, not a loose grip on the things of this world. And as we see this here, again, Haman is moving forward and moving the plot forward. As we see him there, his wife Zeresh gives him this counsel, and Haman sets off to build this gallows so as to do away with the toxicity in his life. And we come now to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, what we're going to see is that the movement of Haman, at the movement of Esther, we come to chapter 6 now, and we hone in not on Haman so much at the first, or Esther, or even Mordecai, but we see now the king. And we're going to see the king, as we read this chapter, really be an instrument used in the moving forward of this plot of the Lord, this plan of the Lord, to have God's people saved. And we're going to see, really, through all of chapter 6, God's favor within this plan that is being hashed out and played out before our eyes as we read. And we're going to read all of chapter 6 in its entirety because, again, this is just a great story. We're going to read it and see it in its entirety because it's a consistent moving plot And as we read, we're going to stop every now and then and make some comments to see what we're going to see here as we open up in chapter 6. So, verse 1 says that that night, again, what's going on here? They just came out of dinner. Haman is upset. He's building a gallows. The king is done with dinner. That night, the king could not sleep. And so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And then the king said, well, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him, they said, nothing has been done for him. If you'll remember back from chapter 2 in the book of Esther, As Esther ascended to the throne, Mordecai is put in the gate in a position of authority there within the city. And there he uncovers an assassination coup of sorts between these two doorkeepers, and he lets someone know about it, and they do away with those guys. He saves the king from this assassination plot. And you'll remember that there in chapter 2, it said that Mordecai did this, it was recorded, but no one knew about it except for those that recorded it. Well, here in chapter 6, we have the king who, after this dinner party, he's awake, he's, 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 he can't sleep. Sleep is, sleep is fleeing from him. And as he's laying there, he has all these options of what he could do, music or, or, or entertainment or whatever, to lull him to sleep. But he's like, man, I really need to get some sleep, so bring in the chronicles, right? He's like, bring in the board minutes, bring in the financials, bring in, bring in the most boring thing you can possibly bring in, and that'll, that'll do the job. And so they bring him the chronicles there, and I want you to really think about what's going on here. 
because they open up the chronicles of this Persian Empire, 127 provinces worth of an empire that has this vast, no doubt, library of chronicles of all the things that have gone on. And they open it to the page recording Mordecai saving the king from assassination. And the king, he's like, well, I'm not sleeping now. What's, what's been done for this guy Mordecai? Like, this dude saved my life. What, what's being done for him? And they're like, well, well, nothing's been done for him. And then the plot continues in verse 4. It says, so the king said, who is in the courts? And they said, and it says there that now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the picture he painted for us, again, the king is, he's got insomnia. He's trying to, he's trying to read himself to sleep. And he's like, oh, Mordecai saved my life. What's being done to honor this guy? And here comes Haman in with his tool belt on, having just finished his gallows. And he's like, all right, how are we going to do away with Mordecai? And verse five says, the king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the courts. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in. The king asked him, what shall be done for the man who the king delights, in, in, delights to honor? And I love this. If you don't think the Bible's hilarious, I'm going to prove you wrong right here. Because it says, now Haman thought in his hearts, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? I mean, just this guy. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, he says, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which, was, which a royal crest is placed on its head. And then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, and then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Again, this is Haman here telling the king, this is what should be done to the king's favorite. This right here. And you can just imagine Haman in his mind. He's just like, it's me. <laughs> I know it's me. He's practicing his wave. He's like, I'm going to be on the horse. It's going to be awesome. And then verse 10, the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested and do so for Mordecai, the Jew who sits within the king's gate and leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Like, I just, that's, that's a, I laugh every time I read it. <laughs> And it gets better. It says, so Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai, and he led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights. Now, I want to see that replayed in heaven one day. I just, I'm going to be very honest with you. Just imagine Haman just walking to the robe, just being like, put it on, you know, just like, come on, man. Get on the horse. Let's, let's go. <laughs> just, 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 just walking around, just like, this is the man that the king delights on. And the king's like, louder, you know, and he's like, fine. I just love, I love this. It's so funny. But even more than the, 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 com the comedy of it, what I love about this is, again, taking all of it in, 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 in its context as a plot and as a story here that the Lord we know is working out. We see in all of this, all of the movement and the organization of the people, something that God is directly involved in. It's no chance or accident that the chronicles that were there to lull the king to sleep that night were turned to the page that would alert him to Mordecai being the one that saved him from assassination. It's no accident that the movement and the pieces that were moving on the chessboard, if you will, of Haman coming into the court at that time, having in his mind this idea to do away with Mordecai, that, that, that was not by accident that the timing was perfect. And we have to believe that because we have to believe, knowing from the Bible, that God is sovereign, that God is that God is om omnipotent and omniscient and he knows and he's working always. And so what we have to see here is God moving and working and everything, orchestrating it all so as to work out his plan to save his people. To work out his plan to see his people saved in the way that he will see them saved as the text moves forward. And it says in verse 12 that after Mordecai went back to the king's gate, he goes back to work that Haman hurried to his house mourning with his head covered. And when Haman told his wife Zeresh and all of his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh, they said to him, and this is important here, it says, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent, then you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were still talking with him, the king's units came and they hastened to bring Haman to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. You know, there is... The wise men in Zeresh speak there to Haman about Mordecai. It's another example, I believe, fully within the Bible where we see the Lord use those that are pagan, those that are not followers of the Lord, to speak out a word of knowledge to those that need to hear something. 
And I believe fully here that it is the Lord who speaks, who uses Zeresh to speak there to Haman that, hey, what you're doing, what you're seeking to do as you're seeking to go up against Mordecai, he, you're not going to win. You've begun to fall and you're going to continue to fall. And then Haman hears that information and then he's whisked away to the banquet that he needs to go to, which Esther had prepared. And we stop there today and save chapter seven for next week. But I want you to notice again, just the movements within the story. And I want you to know something that none of those movements are again by chance. That though, again, we don't see the name of God in any of the book of Esther, though it is not present within the text, he is working throughout all of it. And that goes to show us something that we need to hone in on and remember today as the church. That God is always working. We've said this already within the book of Esther, but as long as we can, we're going to continue to remind ourselves of that because we need to be reminded as God's people that God is always working. And that God is always with his people, even when he can't be seen clearly. Even when you don't feel like the Lord is near to you, understand that God is not far from you. That he's not apathetic or far off or aloof to, to what's going on. The Lord is working and is present with you. And that's important for us to know because there are times, again, where, where we don't feel that, where we don't sense that the Lord is close. We don't sense that the Lord is with us as we're walking and moving and seeking to go for it with him. We don't sense that the Lord is with us whenever we're down and we're at a low and we're like, Lord, I need you right now, but there's no way that I think that you want me. Understand that he does and he is there with you to hold you and lead you and guide you and take you where you want to go. We see this in the text. I am so thankful for this example. Although the Lord is not mentioned, we see him working and orchestrating things the same way he does in our own lives as well. I'm thankful for that in the book of Esther, especially here in chapter 6, because it is just no doubt that the Lord is moving and working. But also, too, along with that comes the encouragement again, the same way that we said a minute ago with Esther. I want to circle back and say again, that as God is working, as he's not far off, as he's not apathetic or aloof to what's going on in this world, so too is he desiring for you and for me to walk with him in this world on mission for him. And he calls each of us to that. He calls all of us to serve, all of us to walk with him. If you are a believer here in the Lord, you're not just a spectator. You're not just one who's meant to come and sit in a seat and then just go. We are called to be those that go with the Lord where he wants to take us. And as we go, that's going to require us to lean into the Lord, to hear how he wants to guide us. And then, as we saw Esther do today, step out when he calls us to do so. Step forward into what he wants to use us in. And I want to encourage us all today to be on the same page and to realize our human nature that says, you know what, Lord, that's scary. That's scary at times. That requires faith, Lord, that you know what? Honestly, sometimes I, I don't have, which I'm thankful to the Lord for because he's kind enough to give us and build within us the faith that we need through his word through the Holy Spirit living within us as we are believers, through counsel of godly brothers and sisters who want to encourage us as he speaks to them and they speak to us about how we're supposed to walk with the Lord and step out into what he's calling us to. I'm thankful for those things and it's only the kindness of the Lord that does that. But understand that all of that prep, all of that preparing, all of that boldness that he seeks to speak into us, it's all played out once we step out. It's all played out once we step out in the faith that God is calling us to step out into. And today, again, just like when we teach about trials, the pastor always says, you're either in a trial or coming out of one or about to go into one. I don't know. I don't say that. Maybe I will. It's the same thing with being called to walk and serve the Lord wherever you're at. The Lord is preparing each of us for something always. And the Lord is calling all of us always to step out with him, to walk forward with him. He's desiring for us to see that he has something for us, a mission that he has for each of us, a purpose that he has placed us on this world in Paris, Texas, or wherever you live for such a time as this, that he calls us to step out with him in faith for. And you're either doing that and stepping out, or you're not. It's very simple. It's very simple for us to look at what God is calling us to do and say, okay, I I'm doing that. Or to say, ah, I'm not doing that. 
And today the Lord would exhort all of us to see what he has and say, Lord, you want to go there? I'm going. You're working there? I want to work there. You're calling me there? I want to do that. And so today for each of us, the question to ourselves again is, what am I doing? Am I stepping out in the faith that God is building within me through his word and through his counsel and through his Holy Spirit? Am I doing that or am I not? And in, in that, am I not stepping out? Am I, am I hindering what God wants to do through me? And if I am stepping out, am I continuing to step out trusting that God's going to continue to meet me? And that's a question that you and I have to answer individually with the Lord. I can't answer that for you. You can answer that between you and God. But as a church, I will say this, that us stepping out in faith, us trusting and being obedient to what God is calling us to individually affects us corporately. Because as the body of Christ, we're called to operate together. We're called to move together as a cohesive body, seeing how the Lord wants to use each of us as a part of that body to glorify him within the local church as we're gathered, but also as we're scattered. And so today, we see the example of Esther who with all the prep and all of the boldness that the Lord gives her, steps out in faith, knowing that the Lord's going to be with her. Again, her last statement of chapter four, if I perish, then I perish. She resigns herself to the work that is before her, knowing that, hey, you know what? <laughs> What's going to happen is going to happen. But at least she stepped out in the faith that she knew she needed to. In the same way, it's true for us. And the call is there for us. So will you, will I, will we, be those that step out as the Lord calls us to do so, knowing that he's there to meet us, knowing that he's there to lead us and be with us every step of the way. And that's a question for you. And it's a question for me. And it's one that I'm thankful the Lord is there to help us with. And so I pray today that we would be a church that would seek that answer from the Lord and seek to walk that out in our lives and see the plan that he wants for our lives set in motion as well as we follow him. Let's pray.